This video is part of the Systems and Proof module for Foundations of Computer Science. We'll walk through a proof by strong induction of one of the claims that we made in passing about a POST system that we introduced. And in later systems, we'll go on to establish a few more of these claims by way of getting practice with inductive proofs. The first system we'll look at was this very simple one that we claimed was for positive multiples of three. And just to refresh your memory, we said the basis rule was that three is in some set M and the inductive rule R is uh, if X and Y are in the set M, then X plus Y is in the set. And we did a derivation showing that we could prove that nine was in this set. But uh, we did not prove our claim that this is in fact uh, all and only the positive multiples of three. So we want to prove both of those things, soundness and completeness. So we'll begin with soundness by strong induction. And so remember what soundness means here is that there's nothing in our set that isn't supposed to be there, right? Doesn't mean that we have all the things that are supposed to be there, but that just that nothing incorrect has gotten into the set. Now, to arrive at a formal statement of soundness, we can begin with our full statement of our theorem, which is N is in the set M if and only if N is a positive multiple of three. And notice this is a biconditional. It is an if and only if statement. So we can decompose it into its two parts, right? The only if part and the if part. And uh, as we're observing here, the only if part is soundness. So that's where we're going to start. We write that out by itself. And we say N is in the set M only if n is a positive multiple of three. And now notice that is just a formal restatement of what I said a few moments ago, that if we have some element in our set, it must be a positive multiple of three, and it cannot be anything else. In contrast, the statement of the if direction is that if n is a positive multiple of three, then it is definitely in the set. So this is what guarantees that all positive multiples of three are in the set. And that is why we refer to it as a completeness statement. So we'll put this if statement on hold for right now. We'll come back to that in a bit. And first just focus on proving the only if the soundness part. Now, how do we do that? Well, we said we we're going to use strong induction, but we need to say a little bit more. In particular, we have to say what value we're going to do our induction on. And the answer here is that we're going to do strong induction on the height of the derivation of our element n. But I have not yet given you a definition of derivation height. And this is something that's specific to post systems. So uh, it's actually pretty straightforward, but to do it, we'll just remind you of our derivation we did that proved that nine was an element of this post system. Remember the first thing we did was we used our axiom to say that three was in the system. And then uh, we had to use that axiom twice in order to get two elements call it again over here. Three is in our system. And then we, we you use these as our X and Y in our rule R. And we ended up with three plus three is in the system. It's in our set M. And then we had to pull in yet another three using another axiom. And we could now join these all together uh, and conclude that three plus three plus three is in the system. So just a bit of review about how that derivation works and that proves that nine is in our set. Now, what I mean by the derivation height of an element in this system is simply how many times do I have to pass from antecedents to consequence or conclusions in order to derive that element or in order to arrive at it. So just starting with these axioms, in this case, the answer is zero, right? There are no antecedents to an axiom. And so I call this an element of derivation height zero. Just mark that there, right? And that's true for all of our axioms that we pull in. All of them have height zero. That is the height of the element three, but we have two other elements we need to look at. 
uh, the first of these is 3 plus 3, so that's distinct. And we want to know what is its derivation height. Well, in this case, we have one pass from antecedents to conclusions, and so we say its derivation height is 1. Finally, it may be very obvious where we're going now, but our last element, uh, 3 plus 3 plus 3, uh, we have to go from an antecedent to a conclusion two times to get to this element, and so we say its height is 2. And now a quick kind of visual way of checking what the height is of an element, if you've written your derivation carefully, you should be able to just say how many of these horizontal uh, lines are there above the element in my derivation. And if the answer is 0, well then you're looking at an axiom. If the answer is 1, then it's derivation height 1, and then if it's 2, it's height 2. So that's all pretty simple, but I'd like to draw your attention to one important detail, which is if we look at this element with height 2, notice that the elements above it have different heights, right? And in particular, we can't conclude that just because we're going up one level, that the elements in the level above will all have height one less than what our element is. That's not something we can always rely on. This uh, element has height zero, even though it's right above an element of height two. That's not the case for all post systems, but it is the case for this post system and many post systems. And in fact, this is exactly the reason we need to use strong induction. And we'll come back to this point later in the proof. So to proceed, what we're going to do is reformulate our uh, only if claim as a parameterized statement S of K, right? And the way we'll phrase it is, if the derivation of an element N in M has height K, then N is a positive multiple of three. Now notice that in our post system, every element has some height. So we really just adding a statement to this that's almost redundant, right? But it is going to help us formulate our proof and divide it easily into its base case and inductive step. So remember, we can write the argument of strong inductive proofs itself as an inference rule using this um, S of K statement once we know what that is. Right? And the, the rule here, we're going to have a base case, one base case, in which we look at S of 0. That's going to represent elements of uh, derivation height 0, so our axioms. And then we're going to say for all k greater than or equal to 0, uh, our statement s uh, of 0 and you know, etc. up to s of k will imply s of k plus 1. And if we can show those two things are true, what we get automatically is for all k greater than or equal to 0, the statement s of k holds. The, what makes this a strong inductive proof is that we haven't simply gone from s of k to s of k plus 1. Rather, our inductive hypothesis allows us to assume that our statement holds for some k, but also all values less than k, uh, as long as they are greater than or equal to what we established in our base case, our 0. That is the full structure of the argument for strong induction. Uh, it is a little dense when we write it all in logical symbols, so we can kind of expand it a bit, uh, and maybe to make it a little more clear. Um, we're first starting with some basis, where we have to show this statement s of 0 is true. And then uh, we have a, a, an inductive hypothesis, which in strong induction, we're allowed to suppose that that uh, s of 0 up through s of k are all uh, true statements where k is greater than or equal to 0. Right? And, and then we have to just show, based on that assumption, that we can get to s of k plus 1. And once everything is set up, it's really just a matter of going through these steps. So let's do it. We'll start with the basis, uh, and that is s of 0. So we, we know the derivation height is 0. And then what that means is that the element we're talking about must have been produced by an application of our rule b, right? which we only had one of. We only have one axiom. And so uh, that's, that's the only thing it could be. So we know that our element n is 3. That's the only element that, that can be produced with a height 0. And that means n is 3. So 
uh, 3 is a positive multiple of 3, clearly, since 3 times 1 is 3. So that establishes our base case. So all that remains then is to establish our inductive step, which admittedly is a little more complicated, but since we set it up, it's not that bad. We have to show s of k plus 1 is true, uh, assuming that our statement holds already at k and all smaller values um, that are greater than or equal to the value we chose for our base case, which in this case was zero, right? So we say we must show uh, that n is a positive multiple of three if uh, n is an element of our set and has a derivation height of k plus one and k is greater than or equal to zero. All right, so we assume that n is such an element when it is it has a derivation height of k plus one for k greater than or equal to zero so what does that mean well when we think about the structure of our post system what it means is that certainly n cannot have a height of zero right because k is at least zero and n has a height of k plus one so that means that n could not have been produced by an axiom it has to be, therefore, produced by our only other rule, which was r. So remember the form of r was that x is an element of m, y is an element of m, implies x plus y is in m. So that's the rule, and I've used x and y, but these are arbitrary variables. So actually, I'm going to use uh, i and j just for consistency with the slide i and i plus j, right? But don't let that throw you, it's exactly the same thing. And this is the form of our element n, as long as its height is greater than zero, which it is because its height is k plus one. So all of that I hope is pretty clear and maybe even obvious, but the reason for saying it is that it gives us the ability to rewrite our element n that we're interested in, in terms of two other elements that have a smaller derivation height. And that's what allows us to use our inductive hypothesis. I've run ahead a little bit to give you a preview of where we're going, but just to catch us up uh, and write that out, what we're saying is, since k is greater than or equal to zero, the derivation must end with an application of rule r. And that means that our n can be expressed as the sum of these elements i and j, which we know are already in our set m. And so by inductive hypothesis, we know that i and j are positive multiples of three already. And just using the definition of positive multiple of three, that means that there are these positive integers a and b uh, such that i is equal to three times a and j is equal to three times b. So that's what a positive multiple of three is. Therefore, we can write our element n that we're trying to prove is a positive multiple of three as the sum of numbers i and j, which are both positive multiples of three. We can rewrite i and j as three times a plus three times b. And with a little arithmetic, we can rearrange that into three times a plus b, right? Where a plus b uh, must be a positive integer. And that is uh, the completion of our proof that shows that n must be a positive multiple of three. Now, before we finish, just to tie this back to our post system and the need for strong induction here, rewrite our rule that we used. And we want to identify that this is n on the bottom. n is our element that we've set is equal to i plus j. And note that the derivation height of n, by our assumption, what we're trying to prove here, that derivation height is k plus 1, right? So what we know about i and j is simply that uh, they have a derivation height that is less than k plus 1, but we don't know exactly what it is, right? We, we know that one of them has a derivation height of k, uh, but we don't know which one. And the other one could have a derivation height of, say, k minus 2, right? We're not sure. So if we had used weak induction, we would not be able to apply our assumption. We would only be able to say we can go from derivation height of k to k plus 1, 
But because we've structured the proof as strong induction, I can also use anything before as long as I'm certain that I'm not going back before my base case. And the reason I am certain that I'm not going back before my base case is that in this example, my base case was a derivation height of zero. And I know that no element can have a derivation height less than zero. So that is the end of our example of a proof using strong induction. In the next video, we'll prove the completeness part of this theorem using weak induction, and you can see how that differs.